The following program is brought to you by Caltech. My name is uh, Mark Wise. I'm a colleague of Harvey's. I'm actually a high energy theorist. He's a high energy experimentalist. Of course, the theorists and experimentalists, we're both after the same thing. In our field, we're trying to understand what the laws of nature are at the most fundamental level possible. And so we attend the same seminars. We talk to each other about the results. and. Uh, even sit on the same uh, thesis committees. But before I get on with the introduction, I want to remind you about the, the next lecture at Beckman. It's on uh, January 27, 2010, and the title is DNA Mediated Signaling. It's by Jacqueline K. Barton, and she's the Arthur and Marion Hanish Memorial Professor and Professor of Chemistry. She's the Chair of the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering here. So. For my introduction, I'm going to give you an outline of the introduction, kind of an ominous beginning. But uh, I've known Harvey for a long time. We actually both arrived at Caltech uh, at the same time. And I could probably describe most of the things that he's been involved with, well, all of the things that involve experimental high energy physics without any notes. But I decided that in order for it to go smoothly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a few prepared remarks at the beginning so I get everything straight. And then I'll say a few things that you probably would only know if you know Harvey very well. Wouldn't be easy to find on the web, even, without, even with, uh, with quite a bit of work. And finally, the culmination, the gag gift. Okay, Harvey received his Doctor of Science from MIT in 1974 and has been a member of the Caltech faculty since 1982. His career has focused on searches for new particles and new forces of nature at particle colliders at the highest available energies, mostly at the DAISY Laboratory in Hamburg and the CERN Laboratory in Geneva. During the period from 1978 to 1982, he co-led the Mark J collaboration at DAISY that discovered the gluon, the carrier of the strong force. A theme of his experiments has been precision measurements of electrons, photons, and muons, which have often been the keys to particle physics discoveries. Since 1994, he and his high energy physics group at Caltech have had central roles in the CMS experiment at CERN's Large Hadron Collider that is now beginning to search for the Higgs particle, which is responsible for giving mass to the known fundamental particles. In addition to the Higgs search, Harvey and his group are searching for Kaluza-Klein graviton decays, which would signal the existence of extra dimensions of space, and together with Professor Maria Seropoulou, for supersymmetry as well as many other exotic forms of new physics. He also leads the Minos, at, Minos and Nova teams at Caltech, which are studying neutrino oscillations. Harvey currently serves as chair of the US LHC Users Organization, which consists of 850 physicists, engineers, and students from more than 80 US universities and laboratories, and is the chair-elect of the American Physical Society Forum on International Physics. In addition to his roles in physics discoveries, Harvey has had leading roles in the strategic planning, development, and operation of international networks and collaborative systems serving the high-energy physics and other scientific communities and the creation of the worldwide computing grid used by the LHC experiments. Harvey has led science and engineering teams that have established more than a dozen Internet 2 land speed records and won several supercomputing bandwidth challenge awards. He has represented the LHC collaboration and the science research community on Internet 2 strategic planning steering committee and its architecture and operations advisory council. As chair of the Standing Committee on Interregional Connectivity of the International Committee on Future Accelerators, Harvey has worked to foster greater equality to, 
of access to data and knowledge in developing countries. As a result of this work, he was awarded honorary doctoral degrees from the Polytechnica University in Bucharest, Romania, and the Pavel Joseph Safaric University in Slovakia. Harvey has also been awarded the Jose Bonificio Medal of the State University of Rio de Janeiro. Of course, Harvey's my colleague. As I mentioned, he arrived in 82, and I've arrived in 83. And of course, I've always been impressed for, about Harvey's work and his dedication to science and his integrity as a scientist. But there's another aspect of Harvey that, that is also rather is truly amazing, and that's his mentoring of students. Of course, we're all expected to mentor graduate students. Some do it better than our others. Harvey does a marvelous job at it. But it's really the mentoring of undergraduate students that I find particularly remarkable in Harvey's case. We work in a very technical field, both Harvey and I, and yet somehow he manages to find projects for undergraduate students, mentor them through those projects so they actually get useful, sometimes very important results at the forefront of science. And I think that's just a remarkable fact. Of course, Caltech is renowned for the quality of its undergraduates, and it's nice to see Harvey and other members of the faculty taking the mentoring of those students seriously. So as I mentioned to you before, uh, Harvey has won these wards, these uh, land speed records, if you like, for, uh, for, for transferring data, large data sets. And uh, of course, we, we attend the same se seminars, and uh, sometimes they're theory seminars, sometimes they're experimental seminars. It used to be at the back of the seminar rooms for the experimental ones, there was a case, and in that case, you could see these awards, land speed record, and then below it would be Harvey Newman and a date. So I'm sitting there in the seminar, let's say it's an experimental seminar, and I'm a theorist, and there's a particularly difficult part of these seminars, the experimental ones for theorists. And that's where the experimentalist tries to convince you that they really understand what they're doing. They just <laughs> They describe in excruciating detail how what they've seen could not be background, how they really understand the errors. And for theorists, this is tough. We really want to know the number and the error, and we want to have some, under some understanding of that error. And of course, if we're not off during that part, we're toast for the end, because we won't understand the error, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's a difficult time. You sort of twist and turn in your seat, and often I would turn around, and I would look at those land speed records in Harvey's name. Then I'd look back at Harvey. And you know, Harvey's a handsome guy, but he doesn't look fast. <laughs> and that would give me a little chuckle, perk me up, and uh, I would be back paying attention for the whole rest of the, the meeting. So Harvey usually comes to work in nice pants, suit pants, and a, a nice shirt, often a white shirt. And I figure I'm going to help him uh, have the right attire so that when he comes to work, he looks fast. <laughs> so I got you these things, Harvey. Uh, I don't expect you to try them on before your talk. So that, I'm hoping you'll wear them to work one day so that you would actually look fast. <laughs> we got the Caltech shorts. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and to go and fit the Caltech t-shirt. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, give a round of applause to welcome Harvey. Thank you so much, Mark. So my first job is to overcome the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, and I'll try those shorts on sometime soon. <laughs> so here it is, the Large Hadron Collider scenes from the Hadron Collider, but we'll, we'll hear all about this. Here is a 27 kilometer or 17 mile tunnel. Actually, this is a sketch superimposed on the geography of Switzerland and France. It's actually 150 to 500 feet below the ground. Here are just some of the physicists involved in this program. Here's my experiment when it was open, and we'll hear more about it. And here's just a small part of the machine that we'll hear all about during uh, my lecture. But what this is all about is the opening of a new era of physics. This is one of the first events we took at a record energy, still low compared to the design energy of the machine, but a record energy of 2.36 tera electron volts. 
So during this lecture, we'll hear a bit more about physics at the high energy frontier, about particle physics, about the LHC accelerator, the experiments, exciting, the very first collisions, and the physics outlook, which is also exciting. This is a vast program, but I'm really happy to say, although it's a worldwide effort, Caltech really is at the cutting edge. I'll talk a little bit about some of these possible new discoveries in many areas, whether the Higgs particles thought to be responsible for mass or an extension of the standard model of particle physics called supersymmetry and a lot of other things. But as experimentalists, what we hope most, and is rather unlikely, but we still hope, maybe even entering a new energy range to discover something really unexpected. And I'll talk just a little bit about some of the challenges. Mark uh, told you a little bit about some of the side things I do. And some of the technological challenges that will be mentioned and how we overcome them. So what about particle physics? You already heard that we study the nature of matter and space-time at the most fundamental level. We'd like to understand what are the most basic constituents of matter and the forces between them. And also, in the previous years, maybe the previous decade or a bit more, there's been an increasing tie between particle physics and cosmology. And so what we learn has implications for the origins and composition of the universe and how it evolved. What Mark also referred to, which is just great, is Caltech is special in all this. And in fact, over the years, we've had undergraduates at Caltech who've been involved in this research in important ways. And recently, I had to uh, remember just how many, there are actually 60 undergraduates who've been um, involved in this program and the one before it. So many of you have heard about the standard model of particle physics. It captures our understanding of the forces and fundamental constituents of matter, a very beautiful and simple picture. One in which particles at their most fundamental level, at least what we know about so far, the particles that make up matter, quarks, which also uh, make up nucleons and nuclei, light particles called leptons, where the electron is, of course, the other main component of atoms, and also two sisters of the electron, which are heavier. Again, three families, each with its own neutrino. And four force carriers, which carry the strong electromagnetic and weak interaction. This is a beautiful theory and a great triumph of the 20th century, but it's incomplete in several ways. A missing element is the Higgs boson, which is thought to give mass to all the known particles. Within this theory, there's really no place for something we know makes up much of our universe called dark matter. And there's also no natural way in this fundamental theory, a quantum theory, to incorporate gravity. So a beautiful theory, but one that we know is incomplete and, in fact, inconsistent. As I mentioned, there's this growing tie between particle physics and cosmology. Just as we have a standard model of particle physics, there has emerged a standard model of cosmology. And within this model, uh, normal matter as we know it is a very tiny fraction of all of the universe. And what's down here, dark matter and dark energy, 96% of the universe, we don't really know what it is. Particle physicists, including working at the Hadron, Large Hadron Collider, might be able to discover what is this dark matter, and we still have no idea what is this dark energy. So we're left with many fundamental questions. This is just a short set. Where does the pattern of particle families and masses come from? Where are the Higgs particles? And what is the so-called Higgs field that we think fills the whole universe? In the early universe, were all the four forces of nature really unified? And does this show because of having to unify them as you go backward in time and to higher and higher energy scales that they should be unified? Does this mean that there's something beyond the standard model, like supersymmetry? Again, what's the nature of dark matter? Why is gravity so weak compared to the other forces of nature? And does this mean that there are extra space-time dimensions? 
Looking at the history of the universe, we think that most of matter and antimatter annihilated about one-tenth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. But why is there this asymmetry? Why is there any matter left at all? And if we look at some of the particles that we know, neutrinos, also quarks, neutrinos, when they travel, why do they oscillate from one type to another? And I put this in white because this is a, uh, still a problem for particle physicists, but we don't have many handles. What is that dark energy? To explore some of these questions, we need to do experiments. What these experiments require are accelerators, powerful machines to accelerate the particles to the highest possible energy, detectors, instruments that surround the place where we cause collisions to occur in the accelerator to measure what happened and to record and measure the properties and topology of the particles that stream out from the point of collision. Computers, but this has now become worldwide ensembles called computing grids to collect, store, distribute, and analyze the data. Analyzed by hundreds of teams now of physicists and students around the world. And of course, people, only a worldwide collaboration of scientists, engineers, technicians, and support staff could design, build, and operate such a complex instrument. Why do we need particle accelerators? Well, by going to higher and higher energy, equivalently, we go to very small wavelengths. This enables us to probe to small distances, smaller and smaller distances to see what's happening at more and more basic levels. We also need energy to create new things. And by going to high energies in the center of mass, we can produce heavier and heavier particles. And so this is why we have large accelerators. And here on the left also, we can see the sort of sequence, which is really uh, recalling a whole sequence of accelerators starting from uh, the big cyclotrons in the 1930s, where by going to higher and higher energies, first we understood nuclear structure, then the nucleons in the nuclei, then the constituents of, nucle of nucleons, quarks, and leptons. And we're still looking, perhaps, for smaller constituents. And also thinking about the equivalence between energy and temperature in the early universe, the LHC takes us, in a sense, back in time and creates particles that have rarely been seen in nature since a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. So here you can see a short history of the whole universe in time, going through various uh, key stages. And here is one trillionth of a second after the Big Bang where the LHC can take us back to. By comparison, looking uh, out with optical telescopes and also the microwave background that survived the Big Bang, we can only go back in time directly to an age when the universe first became transparent to light and electromagnetic radiation about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. What type of accelerator is needed? This is a long history of two types of accelerators, electron-positron accelerators that allow us with a fixed energy to measure things precisely. And I worked at one of those from, uh, called LEP, from 1980 until 2000. And then the Hadron Colliders, proton-proton or proton-antiproton colliders, which go to higher energies. But protons are complex, so you pay a price for working at these somewhat higher center of mass energies. And here the LHC is the end of this sequence, the latest and largest accelerator. So we need a new energy range to search for new phenomena. An exploratory machine, when going into this new energy range for the first time, and actually a proton-proton collider is actually colliding the quarks and gluons inside the proton, which themselves have their own um, distributions of energy. So we can cover a whole range of energies effectively as we collide the quarks and gluons and see what comes out. So we need an exploratory machine with this broadband scanning, and that is a proton-proton collider with the largest possible energy and the largest possible luminosity, namely the LHC. What will we see? We don't know. The most conventional thing I've already said is the Higgs particles, but we could see other things. Will we see supersymmetry I mentioned? 
Will there be, is there no Higgs, in which case at a higher energy something else has to happen? Are there other forms of explaining why the electromagnetic and weak interaction have some uh, relationship? Are there extra dimensions? Uh, the one that's gotten the most press will we create black holes, which are, will be harmless. <laughs> and uh, other forms. We don't know what is out there. There are many things that could happen. We have to be ready and we have to look. So here's the Large Hadron Collider. There are four experiments, the two largest and the ones with a broad range in their physics program to look at the high energy frontier are the one I work on called the Compact Muon Solenoid, or CMS, and our competitor, Atlas, on opposite sides of this 27 kilometer ring. There are also two specialized experiments. One, to study one of the heavier quarks called the bottom quark and its physics, and one to produce heavy ions and new states of matter by colliding lead ions, which will be done for about one month each year in the Large Hadron Collider Tunnel. How does the accelerator work? Well, protons are accelerated by powerful electric fields, and they're guided around that circular track by powerful superconducting dipole magnets that bend them in a circle, and quadrupoles, quadrupole meaning four poles, that focus the beams around the ideal orbit. To reach the required energy, to keep it in a circle at that energy, we need a magnetic field of 83,000 Gauss, which is about 200,000 times the Earth field. And in order to put enough current through the magnets to generate this field, we have to have superconducting magnets, which work at only two degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. And to keep the beam circulating with a long lifetime so we can keep passing bunches of particles through each other to create the collisions, the particles travel in a tube whose vacuum is better than the vacuum in outer space. How does it compare to the previous uh, collider, which is now operating at Fermilab near Chicago? In terms of the center of mass energy, it's about seven times more. And when it reaches its design luminosity in a couple of years from now, it'll be 30 times the luminosity. This is a measure of the intensity, how many events we can produce. The higher the luminosity, the better we can look for very rare processes and for new types of physics. This tells you a little bit about the superconducting magnets. There are actually a total of about 9,000 magnets, but the big ones, the dipoles and the quadrupoles, are about 1,700. And the cryogenics, the liquid helium, this is the biggest liquid helium plant really ever. Uh, a reminder, some of you who know science and the history of science remember hammerling on us in 1908, first uh, discovered and produced liquefied helium. He was able to produce about a 16th of a liter per hour. Well, the LHC today has 120 tons of this liquid helium and produces 32,000 uh, liters of liquid per hour. Another thing about this is the stored beam energy. Uh, as we go up in energy, the energy of each particle goes up, but we make also more and more intense colliders. So compared to previous machines here, in terms of the stored beam energy, the LHC is special. The stored beam energy is up at 362 megajoules. What does that mean? There are two examples. This is about 200 sticks of dynamite, so if we lose the beam, it will be a problem. So the beam has to be well controlled when it's running at design intensity. Another way, it's uh, 35 pounds of Swiss chocolate. That's the caloric content. You know, a calorie, a food calorie is a kilocalorie, so that's... Uh, uh, admittedly, the energy released by the dynamite is somewhat faster. Uh, Mark talked about fast, <laughs> so I'll talk fast. Uh, the energy, if it was in the form of TNT, but the beam would be like that, create an explosion. Uh, the chocolate releases its energy somewhat slower. Here's the LHC. Amazing that it's finished and operating. Uh, this shows uh, a picture of all the sectors, 27 kilometers. The pale blue means it's at 2 degrees Kelvin. And you can look at all the magnets, each of little yellow squares in all the sectors is the magnet sitting at its operating temperature of 1.9 degrees Kelvin. 
How it works is we have many bunches. An increasing number of bunches are put in the machine. The intensity of the bunches is increased, so will the energy be increased over time to reach the design luminosity. 40 million times a second, bunches of protons pass through each other. What we're really interested in are the quarks and gluons in the protons to make them collide. Every time a bunch of protons passes through an opposing bunch, there's an average of about 20 interactions. So there are about a billion collisions a second being created. Most of these we already understand and don't really care about. We're looking for the rare and new ones. For example, for the Higgs, some of the main ways that we'll find the Higgs require finding one event in 10 trillion. And that's a lot of what our science is about selecting them, and then finding them and analyzing them. The experiments. Well, here I have a cartoon to quickly uh, uh, explain what's going on. The experiments surround the place where the particles come together, in this case, proton collisions. And you produce from these collisions many types of particles, photons, electrons, muons, quarks, neutrinos, oh, and we hope some new types of particles which I'll say a little bit about. And there are specialized layers. There are trackers which follow the charged particles through space, and the magnetic field bends them so you can measure their momentum. There are things called calorimeters, first for the electromagnetic particles that absorb the energy of photons and electrons and convert them into either light or charge. In my experiment, it's light and then charge. And then we measure their energy precisely that way. And the quarks, well, uh, they appear in nature as particles we call hadrons, like pions, kaons, protons. And they're absorbed in, an, in a, another layer. And then muons get all the way to the outside. And we actually measure them inside and outside and measure their momentum. What about neutrinos? Well, neutrinos are very weakly interacting. We don't actually measure them, but we can see in the energy balance in the event because if there are neutrinos or if there are all other new weakly interacting particles, that there's some energy missing. And so some of the signatures have to do with finding missing energy. So here's CMS. I say, a new definition of compact. <laughs> this is the building with the people, the six stories. And this is our big detector. Oh, it's not so big because here's Atlas. OK, well, uh, CMS is the heaviest uh, particle detector ever built, 12,500 tons. It has a very high field, so it can analyze, momentum analyze the particles very well. Atlas uh, bends them in a bigger volume. That's how it gets its bending power. And it has a different design, and it's bigger. Well, you know, people on CMS say, so what? You know, Atlas floats. It's actually, so our density is very high. And the, the density of Atlas is actually less than that of water. Of course, it has big spaces inside. So CMS weighs 12,500 tons, and Atlas only weighs 7,000 tons. Here's a picture of CMS. CMS is a very interesting new design for a particle detector. It is really modular, and that makes a difference. So you see it, a cartoon of it open. We'll see it really in a second. Uh, particles here start in the middle, go out through these pixel detectors of silicon, a tracker made of silicon strips. This is a lot of silicon. If you think about how much silicon is in your computer at home, uh, we have about a million times more silicon, 200 square meters of silicon. Then we have these crystals to measure, 90 tons of crystals to measure electrons and photons precisely. Then the hadron calorimeter of brass and plastic. And um, then we have these layers of iron. So the field, which is created by this very powerful um, coil, superconducting coil, that's 40 kilogauss. That's actually a higher field in the machine to bend the particles. The field is returned in the iron, which are the red layers. And in between, we have these chambers to measure muons on the outside. So you see it open. There are these central. Um, central disk, there are central um, barrel parts here and these disks on the end. And it can be opened within days. There. 
So now let's see a time lapse of putting a building CMS. Wait for it to get going. So first, in the assembly hall on the surface, we have these big iron, iron slices. Then they're instrumented with chambers. Then here's my colleague, Maria Spiropoulou, in the inner detector uh, inside the Hadron calorimeter. Then a 2,500-ton crane lowered pieces of 1,000 to 2,000 tons down from the surface down 500 feet to the experimental floor. This is the heaviest piece, 1,920 tons, held by a 2,500-ton crane, and it took 11 hours to come down to the floor. Down, it says really heavy lifting, it says. Okay, then it landed. Fortunately, it got to the right place. Okay, well, here are some things about the magnet that bends the particles. It's really the most ambitious magnet ever built. The stored energy is 2.7 gigajoules. We heard a unit of energy before, so I needed another analogy. So instead of chocolate, I have the kinetic energy of the largest mobile man-made object, which is the Nimitz-class carrier at 20 miles an hour. That's the stored energy in the magnet. After 15 years, here's CMS, all buttoned up, ready to operate for the first time. Here you can see some of the inner parts just before it was closed up, the tracker, which is very beautiful. But then before we talk about the startup, I said I would just talk a little bit about some of the special technologies. Well, uh, 10 to the 9 interactions a second, which have to be uh, filtered and stored. This generates a lot of uh, data, huge amounts of data. And this is a simulation of a Higgs event. This is the way it would look in the inner part of the, our detector before picking out the interesting part, which is the Higgs event. In this case, the Higgs produces two Z particles, and then from that, four muons, about one event in 10 trillion. So how to handle this problem? So this is something I invented 11 years ago at my desk. It's a cartoon about how data flows from the experiment and is analyzed for the first time at the laboratory, then goes to a series of national centers. And from there, there are all these centers at universities, the first of which I also uh, designed and built at Caltech. There are now 140 of these. And then all the physics groups each have a cluster of computers for local needs, and you have this whole ensemble. Well, all of this depends upon networks, and so I got involved in networks, actually before I drew this picture. And um, to understand how well we can make it work. So it works very well. And then how do you manage it? We also build intelligent systems to manage it all. So this is a picture of the world, and we're monitoring a lot of the links. And then these little circles, each of this is a cluster of computers. So we stack up a lot of them coming out of the Earth um, from some of the major centers. So those are, that's one set of uh, challenge. The other one I wanted to mention was the crystals that we work on. Um, since 1983 here at Caltech, we've been working on these scintillating crystals. In previous experiments, we worked with other types of crystals, which are heavy, but none as heavy as this one, lead tungstate crystals, which are heavier than iron and are clear like glass and transmit the light to photodetectors and we're able to measure electrons and photons very precisely. And then over here, we're looking to the next generation. I'll mention at the end the super LHC in several years from now, and the very radiation hard crystals that we're developing in our laboratory. Uh, Professor Tambrello, Tom Tambrello, first told us about uh, some of the material which goes in these crystals. OK, what about physics at the LHC? Well, like I said, we, we're not colliding protons really as far as we're concerned. We're colliding quarks and gluons. So I can compare the LHC with its gluon-gluon collisions and quark-quark collisions to the present gluon-gluon. This is actually the present one. The Tevatron is actually a proton-antiproton collider. But you can see that in terms of energy, it cuts off down here. In units, this is one tera electron volt over here. And the LHC goes out to several times that. So we have great reach, and that's why this is the first accelerator that will probe deeply into the multi tera electron volt scale, and there are many reasons to believe that we'll find some form of new physics. What can we find? Well, like I said, the first thing we think of is the Higgs. 
This is the only Higgs in nature, Peter Higgs, the mathematician <laughs> that we've observed so far visiting CMS. So I've seen one Higgs. OK. Uh, from previous experiments, so this is actual results of a fit to all this precise data from the previous round of experiments. And if you look at this, you can determine, we can see the effects of the Higgs indirectly. If the Higgs is really there, um, it has to be below 163 GV. This is well within the range of the LHC. Direct searches have also been made. Um, the previous round of experiments I worked on showed it's above 114 GV. This means about um, 120 times the mass of the proton in equivalent energy. And recently in the news, there was an exclusion by Fermilab, because they're collecting more and more data themselves, and they're able to exclude the Higgs mass in this narrow range. And this narrow range of exclusion is increasing as they get more and more data. How does the Higgs work? On the recommendation of one of my very best undergraduates, I have to include these two slides. To understand how the Higgs works, imagine there's a room full of physicists. This is like the universe. And they're, they fill the space. And they're chattering quietly. You know, They're going about their business. Um, they represent the Higgs field. Then a famous scientist walks in the room. Some of you recognize who that is. And as soon as he enters the room, they all turn towards him and are attracted to him. Wow, you want to talk to him? And so they crowd around him, and soon he can't even move anymore. And so he's acquired mass, and this makes it very hard for him to move through the universe. This is like a particle acquiring mass from the Higgs field. How do we find the Higgs? Well, this is a sort of quick uh, view. Um, there are special ways that the Higgs shows up. It decays into two photons of its light. And this is where we think it will be. This is a rare process compared to many other uh, events with the Higgs, but one that we can distinguish from all the standard model backgrounds, and it's just, it's not easy. It's something we've worked on for many years. If it's somewhat heavier, it'll decay into four particles, like four muons that will get all the way to the outside, or possibly uh, four, we call them electrons roughly, we mean electron, positron, electron, positron, and we can measure them inside in the crystals, and if it's even heavier, by this time, it'll be uh, not the simplest form of the standard model, if this is true, then two electrons or muons and some jets of particles. This is a real analysis. This is important to us. Here's a simulated event. This is uh, what the Higgs should look like, but it's an exaggeration. It's not this easy. This is 20 times the height of the peak. And here are all the standard model backgrounds. And we have to find this peak above the backgrounds. What's the key? Well, the key is the narrowness of that peak, getting the high resolution out of those crystals. Uh, there are very sophisticated methods, the latest of which is developed by one of our graduate students. But down here, I've written some of the people, including not only graduate students, but also undergraduates over here, who have contributed to this analysis. This is great. And Mark, who introduced me, uh, Mark is a clever guy. And so he said, look, what you think you know he found an escape, a way to escape. And maybe the Higgs is produced uh, even more than you think it would be. Could also be less. Life could be hard. But we need to be ready because it could appear sooner than we think. OK, the Higgs, the standard model has lots of problems. No dark matter particle. Uh, actually, this, the Higgs mass can't even be stable. It's not self-consistent. No unification in the early universe. Uh, it doesn't really fulfill the requirements of string theory, the one theory of a, one possible unified theory. So maybe we have supersymmetry. This is the most appealing extension of the standard model. But if so, there are many new particles. For every, here's again the standard model particles, each one there's a partner. We know the partners have to be heavy, otherwise you would have seen them already. Also, maybe different, different by one half unit of angular momentum. How do you find supersymmetry? Well, you get these, you produce supersymmetric particles. These are partners of gluons. And there's a long chain. And you get jets of particles and sometimes electrons and muons. But at the end, there are these weakly neutral, inter, there are weak interacting neutral particles. And we don't really see them, so they create that missing energy. We wonder, 
if we find these things, that would be great, because this is a consistent theory. But we wonder, is this the source of the dark matter in the universe? That we also don't know. Okay, so we're looking for supersymmetry, especially my colleague Maria Spiropoulou. Great. And she has a wonderful strategy for finding this and then figuring out what's going on. And this is actually geared to the early data. You get spectacular signatures uh, with jets, and this arrow represents the missing energy. And, uh, but you have to understand your detector very well and quickly. So that's part of the program. And she, together with our best student, uh, Chris, are working on this. And he will search in the early data, maybe even 2010, for supersymmetry distinguishing the background, the, the signal from the background by using this missing energy. So here's a signal. And this is a background actually multiplied by three because, you know, even if you don't understand the background that well, you'll be able to see the signal above the background. Like I said, if we find supersymmetry, are these the dark matter particles? We don't know. We know there's dark matter. If we find supersymmetry, it might be the supersymmetric particles. Otherwise, dark matter, there's not enough visible mass in rotating spiral galaxies, so they hang together as they rotate. They don't fly apart. And also we know by looking at light propagating through the universe that the mass bends the light, so we see distortions and sometimes even multiple uh, images or rings. There's lots of dark matter out there. Why is gravity so weak? People have uh, worried about this for a long time and thought that perhaps um, the, the energy scale at which gravity becomes like the other interactions is not so far away as in the very early universe. And maybe it's even accessible at the LHC. Recent ideas think that there are these extra dimensions of space. Why is it related to gravity being so weak? Well, the standard model particles maybe live on some sub part of space, you know, like a membrane in a bigger space, like here. And maybe gravity lives mainly on this other brain a short distance away. And space is also warped in such a way that we only feel the residual effects of gravity. Aha! Uh -huh. In this space, you can actually have new particles, resonances, you know, like waves in a box. You can have standing waves. And so one could have these resonances, and one of the best ways to find them are, again, through these two photons, but very high-energy photons. And this is an analysis done by our group. How can it be that there are additional dimensions of space and you don't feel them? So there are cute analogies here, too. Imagine an acrobat walking a tightrope. Well, she can only, you know, walk along one dimension. But what about a flea? A flea is much smaller. You can say, aha, this rope actually has an additional dimension, and it can actually work in two dimensions, along and around the rope. And we also think that the extra dimensions are somehow compactified, all curled up. And that's also like the flea. If the flea goes around the rope, then it comes back to where it started. Here again is an analysis to show you that we do real stuff. <laughs> For different masses, these are the peaks and a very recent analysis, again, by, done by students. I mean, Elliot Schneider, you know, an undergraduate, together with uh, postdoc and Toyoko Oromoto, who is now a fellow at CERN. And uh, then we can search for different masses and strains of the coupling. But even in 2010, if such particles exist up to 1.5 TeV, we should be able to find them. So early discovery is possible. And then, finally, you see John Liu, who visited us. I'll say a bit more. This is one of our very best undergraduates here, Andy. And uh, he's the first one to do an analysis of looking for strings, but, you know, strings as in string theory, but in an accessible range. And so looking at a recent, from a recent paper, we look for events with a photon and jets, and maybe there'll be something there. And finally, there might be something more fundamental than quarks or leptons. And so that would give very exciting signatures like this. With here, this one has an electron, a positron, and a photon. And again, an analysis and very early discovery reach. Great. We're trying to be ready for anything that can happen. 
Oh, yes, black hole. OK. Uh, if the black holes, perhaps there's a scale of gravity which is also in the TeV range. And if you have a black hole which is slightly above that energy range, you could produce a black hole. Then as the black hole spins down, as shown here, this is from Scientific American, then you get all these particles coming out of all types, electrons, photons, but also things like Higgs, a very spherical event. So here's Stephen Hawking visiting CMS and patiently waiting for us to, to see if we're going to see black holes. Uh, you've heard a lot in the press. Uh, this is very safe. A micro black hole um, decays very rapidly into these particles, and there's basically not very much energy. Um, if something were going to happen, it would already have happened, because nature actually produces much more energetic events than this. OK, we had a great startup a year ago, September 10th, 2008. This is the control room of the LHC. And you see all these people, some working hard, some cheering, some, you know, in a state of awe. A great start. And Google was also impressed you know, on that day. OK. Um, within an hour, we're able to get the beam to go around. That was amazing to the group. And the second beam took about two hours. See the bunch of the protons go in, as shown on a screen, then go all the way around and come, come out. These are five generations of directors, kind of seeing if this, you know, the sort of fruition of a lot of uh, work. And the beam was captured and stored. Uh, the media showed this to a billion people. We also have this collaborative system, about 1,700. We opened it up, and we had 1,700 people interacting during this goings on. The first thing that was done was to bring the protons upstream of the experiment, not yet into the experiment and to stop it, a very small beam, 10 to the 9 particles, a billion particles, which is tiny compared to the design beam. And it produces waves of muons when the beam is stopped, maybe a million muons per splash. And we saw this energy throughout our detector, and then all these particles going through our detector. Well, our detector held up, and also the data acquisition system held up. And we looked at the energies in the different layers, and they were linear because of all these different particles. The detector was behaving very well. And we actually saw energies like 3,000 TeV in one case. A nice start. Not yet the experiment. Well, um, progress went well for a total of nine days. There are 123,000 connections in this machine, and tens of thousands of those are connections, are welds, or soldering between elements of superconductors. One of them wasn't done well. As the current was raised, eventually it reached the point where one of the superconductors with thousands of amperes going through it went normal. It then melted and punched a hole in the inner vacuum, the outer vacuum. Tons of liquid helium escaped. About four and a half tons of liquid helium went into gas, filled the hall and sent a pressure pulse down the beam tube until there were limiting flap valves to stop such things from happening. But the load on those valves was such that the magnets were ripped off their uh, mounts. So these magnets, which were beautifully aligned to, to millions of a meter, now some of them were displaced by one and a half feet. A great program of recovery ensued. And here's the result. This is where the incident was. Then the magnets were replaced, a total of 53 magnets. Four kilometers of beam tube were cleaned. The magnet protection system was upgraded so that such things could not happen again. And also the pressure ports, the relief ports that weren't big enough, hmm, that's been improved too. So this tells you all about the different things that were done, all done extremely well. And now we also have a new uh, crunch protection system to prevent this from happening again. The physicists were also busy. We had a year to understand our detector better. So we used cosmic rays coming down from the atmosphere. Here's a cartoon, a proton comes in mainly, and then after a cascade, muons get down to the surface level and below the surface into the experiment. Here's a muon going through. The magnet was on. You see it bending. 
we took about a billion cosmic rays with a full field of uh, nearly 40 kilogauss, calibration, alignment, characterizing the detector responses, tuning up the software, and the simulations. This was really useful, and we never imagined until the recent months how well that paid off. Okay, in the meantime, we had some visits. Uh, here's a little note. Here's a character you all know. Some not only always with pleasant memories or thoughts. Here's Bill. Uh, more important, here's one of our graduate students working on the detector before it was closed up again. Here's Jean Lou, who visited us uh, in last June with some members of our team. Uh, some are our physicists and students, and also some of our engineers who work on networking and collaborative systems and other things. Then we closed the detector up by July, and we got started. Amazing uh, start. 26 remarkable days. This again shows the beam going in and then coming back around and actually making two turns uh, seen in the screen, and they took the screen out. Um, November, well, the first injection was in October. November 20th was the start of the beam. The first beam was circulated within a bit more than two hours. The beam was captured and really started to circulate for several minutes within less than four hours. Then the second beam was captured. This was all in the first evening. Then the first collisions at 900 GeV. This is the injection energy. Remember, the design energy is 7 TeV or 7,000 GeV. And within hours, there were collisions in all four experiments, including ours. Then the first physics fills, amazing, December 6th, four proton bunches, eventually there'll be 2,800, and ran for about four hours. Then they began to make this an accelerator. It was a collider, also has to be an accelerator. And they reached the record energy of 1.18 TeV, and then moved on to higher intensities and increased the luminosity a bit. And actually, this is a run. I'll show you something from this for a couple of minutes. 2.36 TV, and then continued to increase the intensity until it got close to the time before Christmas. Oh, here, they actually squeezed the beams to increase the luminosity. They'll have to do a lot of that. And that was it. First collision event in CMS. Here's a better picture. Great. You see the tracks for charged particles, OK? You can see the various elements in the calorimeter. The things sticking out are um, electromagnetic energy, which is recorded and where, at what angle, and then the energies in the hadron calorimeters. We took at the injection energy 400,000 events, and at the record energy 20,000 events in just about two hours. And here you see a three-dimensional view of such an event. We were surprised. Things work so well. So we started to take collision data, and on average, more than 99% of the electronic channels, or 100 million channels, including the silicon pixels, were operation, operational. And in spite of various small problems, we had more than 80% efficiency to start. Sometimes it takes months to get to this point, but this is the first days. And we found that data could be analyzed, and the reconstruction of physics quantities was working. So instead of saying, you know, what are our problems, we were suddenly challenged to just get results. It's an amazing time. One of the first things was done by our group. We need to calibrate 76,000 crystals at once. And we figured out we could do that with this large flux of particles, very common particles called pions, but the neutral ones that go to two photons, uh, we could do that. And what amazed us is this is a simulation on the left. You see the, the pi zero peak, the pi and peak, and this is a real data. It looked the same, the signal to background looked the same, the resolution looked the same. Hmm. So things are really working, and also some of the, you know, the standard model, this is still a new, sort of a, well, this is not 900 GB, but there's no reason to believe that things would look quite this well in the first shot. Well, they did. Then charged particles. So here we could see the spectrum of charged particles. The points are the data. The red line is, a, is the simulation. And the soft physics the, of the standard model 
really matches the data to a degree you wouldn't expect. Similarly, we found uh, well-known resonances uh, to really test the apparatus. You could see the resolution of the peaks, the red curve, and the data match extremely well for these resonances so fast. I mean, this run was in the early morning hours, then by the daily run meeting on Sunday the 6th at 9 a.m., so here's the results. And the next day, the first resonance is going to charge particles. Then jets at record energies. This is a new result. Multi-jet events, this is one. Uh, you know, the quarks are moving in the protons, so when you bring them into collision, let's say you have a gluon in one and a gluon in the other, it can be moving along the beam line. And so you see this event, which is actually moving, because the total momentum along the beam line is not zero, but transverse to the beam line, it's very well balanced, as you'd expect. And so we're looking again at the standard model, but now in a new energy range. So we're really ready to start a discovery program. Fantastic. And this shows our understanding of jets of particles, which is extremely good. The yellow is a simulation. The black is the data. And this is the performance. How much missing energy do we see in standard model events? Because we want to know that there are not events with very large missing energy because of instrumental effects or because of a lack of understanding. Uh, we don't want to see that because we want to look with much more data for new sources of missing energy, like supersymmetry. And already first physics results. And this morning we had a very detailed set of meetings uh, treating these very basic results, but in a new, also in a new energy range now. This is beyond what's in these plots. The, um, the number of charged particles in each event is a function of, this is a function of the angle relative to the beam line. And then we put our data point among many experiments of the past and present to show how it fits together, looking at the average uh, spread of jets of the charged particles. So here we're going. This is a plot of all the physics going down from known physics up here, down towards things like the Higgs and supersymmetry down there. We started with very low luminosity. We quickly went up by more than a factor of 10 in some days. This is a logarithmic scale. We have quite a ways to go. And we got down to about here. Maybe by 2011, we'll get to where the Higgs is. Finally, when the LHC is operating, instead of what we saw up to about 40 collisions per second, maybe a billion at a higher energy. So now, the end of that run, December 18th. So here's a little clip, which I'd like you to follow about what happened during that run at record energy. Yesterday at 6.03 p.m., the LHC ended its first full period of operation in 2009 after 26 days. Stable beams were circulating in the machine and collisions were recorded at the world record energy of 2.36 tera electron volt by all the experiments. Let's take a look at the highlights of this successful high energy run in ATLAS and CMS. Yeah, it is the last night here. It has been many long nights here. So the LHC, um, its plan is for tonight to ramp the energy up to um, the 1.18 TeV per beam, as they did now two nights ago again. And then they also want to, this night, do what they call a squeeze, which is to focus the beams um, at CMS. And so we want to capture these events. Are we on internal clocks? Not yet. Can you give us three? So we're recycling the car and we're going to be able to see events. Okay, good. Okay. Good. That's nice. Yeah. No, no, these are these are These are, these are, these are a very nice way to uh, finish the run. Uh, we only started about three and a half uh, weeks ago. Uh, very good progress has been made both by the LHC accelerator and the experiments. Uh, and uh, CMS also uh, made very good progress. Uh, so. Uh, we demonstrated uh, that we could take uh, uh, data efficiently and that we could analyze the data quite rapidly. 
So we are in fact preparing uh, the ground for a uh, rapid uh, restart uh, next year after the technical stop that we're going to have over Christmas. We first saw our first collisions at 1.2 TeV uh, on December 8, I think. Uh, there were actually three minutes of, uh, of collisions, let's say, in parasitic mode. Mm -hmm. So while the accelerator people were basically adjusting and preparing things, uh, we were, since we were taking data already and we were trying to catch anything which might be interesting. So we managed the first time to catch uh, 120 about uh, collisions at 2.36 TeV. Then again last weekend, in the, I think it was around the 10th, uh, we caught about uh, 20,000 collisions. Now there was a, a longer time period with uh, the collisions again at uh, higher energy. Uh, right now we haven't, uh, because there's been uh, very little sleep and so on, a lot of things happening, a lot of decisions very, really, very quickly on the fly. So uh, I think we, we need a vacation to see, to actually see a little bit what happened. Some, some people actually don't know anymore what day it is and, and so on. So, so it's been uh, very interesting. Basically it's been fantastic. We, start, we have done everything we hope to do. Both beams went in rather easily. We captured the beams, we collided the beams, we accelerated the beams, we declared stable beam physics, we got the machine protection system working and working well, we got the collimation in, and I think it was an absolutely phenomenal 26 days, which I personally will never forget. The world's most powerful accelerator has now been put in standby mode and will restart in February 2010. In the meantime, Happy New Year. Great. So the LHC is back. In that short plan, everything that was planned was achieved. That was a surprise. What's our plan? By February 20th, we'll be back online. We'll be taking data, but now in a really new energy range. So 3.5 TV per beam, starting in late February by early March, and I'm sure you'll hear all about it. And then we expect after running for about a month or so, I mean, that has to be determined exactly how long we run at 7 TV in the center of mass, we'll move up to about 10. And we'll spend the rest of the year uh, running around 10 TV. Then at the end of the year, I also mentioned they will use lead ions and collide them to create new states of matter uh, using these uh, heavy ions. What about the longer term future? This is the 15 year outlook. What's going to happen is the luminosity, which is on the a vertical scale, will, be, will increase. The accumulated luminosity will move fast. This is, again, a log scale. And as we move up this curve, many new physics scenarios will open. Higgs, supersymmetry, other things I didn't mention, sisters of the Z particles that carry the weak interaction, a more composite, more fundamental particles, which are actually making up quarks, perhaps, and leptons and reaching scales of many TeV. After about seven years, some of the key components have to be replaced. First, around the interaction region because of irradiation and wanting also to have a bigger, well, to be able to focus the beam, beams better. And then a year-long shutdown to replace some of the major components, especially the injection system, reach then considerably higher luminosity and really reach the highest possible reach in terms of new physics of the whole program. Exciting, the first real physics run, much more than the last weeks, uh, will already occur in late February, early March. So now, coming to the end, uh, an outlook. So about, what about a perspective? Well, we are leaving, in a way, leaving the land of what we know. And so I look back in the literature for various quotations. First, Andre Gide, who was the Nobel Prize in Literature, not a physicist, but the Nobel Prize in Literature of 1947, said, well, when you enter a new, you go to discover new lands, you often have to leave, you leave what you know, and often for quite some time, uh, you have to lose sight of the shore. Namely, if we discover something new, we may not understand it for quite a long time, but ultimately we will. And here, like Galileo said, 
All truths are ultimately easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. <laughs> but best of all, turned out to be Benjamin Franklin for a high-energy physicist. Energy and persistence conquer all things. Great. Okay, but we're in it for the long haul, and it may take another generation for physicists like this one, assuming she'll become a physicist, to figure out dark energy. So um, I hope you appreciated this uh, story about the, what is happening at the LHC. And here on the web, you can find a lot more information and also my presentation, and I thank you. <laughs>